Hey, econ students, this is Jacob Clifford. Welcome to the Macroeconomics Unit 2 Summary Video. In this video, I'm going to explain all the concepts that you need to know. First thing, go grab the study guide that goes with Unit 2. This is part of the Ultimate Review Packet. Fill that out along the way to verify you're actually getting the concepts. Remember, these videos aren't designed to teach you all the concepts again. I have videos on YouTube that do that. These videos are designed to get the concepts back in your brain and make sure you know them well enough to get ready for your test or the AP exam or whatever you have in the future. That's why the study guide is going to help you learn. If you can fill this out, then you get it. If you don't know this, you got to go back to YouTube, watch some videos over again. Now, before I cover any of the topics in Unit 2, keep in mind that macroeconomics is the study of the whole economy, and it's designed to do two things. One, measure the health of the economy. That's a lot of damage. And two, fix it. Flex seal works. So a macroeconomics class will focus on both these things. So here in unit two, we're going to talk about measuring the economy. We're going to look at how to measure growth and unemployment and inflation. And then in unit three, we'll talk about how to show some of those concepts on a graph. And then in the end of unit three and all through unit four and unit five, we'll talk about the second part, which is fixing the economy with fiscal and monetary policy. And finally, in unit six, we'll talk about the other part of the economy, which is international trade, foreign exchange, and things that have to do with other countries. So I just wanted to give you that quick overview before before we jump into all the concepts we're about to learn here in Unit 2. So let's go. Now remember, I'm sticking to the AP Macroeconomics curriculum, but if you're a college student or you're taking the CLEP exam, it's all the same. Introductory Macroeconomics covers the same topics, but these are the topics I'm going to cover in this exact order. So here we go. The first one I'll talk about is GDP and the circular flow model. Then I'll talk about the limitations of GDP and how GDP doesn't actually measure everything. Then I'll talk about the idea of unemployment. Then I'll jump into the whole idea of inflation, how to measure inflation with price indices and the inflation rate and the CPI. Next, I'll talk about the cost of inflation, so who's helped and who's hurt by unanticipated inflation. Then I'll talk about real and nominal GDP and finish it off with the business cycle. The key to understanding this unit is to remember that every economy has three goals, to grow over time, to reduce unemployment, and to keep prices stable. And that's what we're doing in this unit. We'll talk about GDP and how do you measure growth. We'll talk about unemployment and how do you measure unemployment. And the last one, we'll talk about inflation and how do you keep prices stable. And it all starts with GDP, gross domestic product. So here in topic 2.1, we're talking about GDP and the three different ways to measure it. The expenditures approach, income approach and the value added approach. I'll also talk about what's included and not included in GDP. Now I've already made a video that explains topic 2.1 in detail. So do me a favor, take out the study guide for 2.1, fill out that whole section, and let's see if you actually understand those concepts. You can figure out those equations and you can actually answer all these. If you can do that, that means you get it. So right now, stop this video, fill out the study guide, and then start the video back up again. Okay, here we go. Remember the definition of GDP is the dollar value of all final goods produced in a country's border. In any given year. So remember the key to that is the final goods. We're not looking at intermediate goods. We're talking about inside the country's border in a year. But keep in mind that we're talking about both goods and services. So a lot of teachers and professors will give you questions where they'll ask you, does this count towards GDP? Does that count towards GDP? So we're talking about goods and services. So like tuition for college does count towards GDP because something was provided, a service was given. And like I said earlier, there's three ways to measure the GDP. The first one, the expenditures approach is by far the most important one. It adds up all the spending on all the goods and services in the country. And it gives you the most important equation in all of macroeconomics. It's right here. C plus I plus G plus XN. Remember, all the things around you can be purchased by one of four different entities. The first one is consumers, and the vast majority of the United States economy is consumer spending. That's people like you and me buying stuff. The second one is investment, which is businesses buying stuff. Usually we're talking about capital. So machines, tools, and factories, that's business spending, which we call investment. And of course, there's government spending, so we're talking about infrastructure like roads or government spending on national defense or services provided, but not transfer payments. A transfer payment is when the government gives money to people like social security or welfare and they're not providing a good or a service. Again, this is the kind of thing that a professor or a teacher likes to ask. They're going to ask, okay, does social security count as part of government spending? And the answer is no, because nothing new was created. I'll talk more about that in a second. The last part of the equation is net exports, exports minus imports. Again, I say this is the most important equation because it is, you're going to see it all over the place in unit three and unit four. When we're talking about fixing the economy, a lot of times we're going back 
to this equation and say, okay, what is the government trying to do here? Who are they trying to increase the spending for? How are they trying to expand GDP? Now, the other way to measure GDP is the income approach, which is not adding up all the spending, it's adding in all the income from all that spending. The equation here is not as important as the expenditures approach, but you gotta know it. It's the idea that wages plus rent plus interest plus profit equal the total income made in the economy, the GDP. And it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about income, like national income, that's just the same as GDP. Income, spending, same, because whatever people spend is what people make in income. The last way to measure GDP is the value added approach. And this adds up all the different value added at each stage of production. In the production process, we go from raw materials to finished product. And along the way, there's value added by different companies. And that value added can be added up and it's a value added approach. And the last thing you have to learn here in topic 2.1 is the circular flow model. Now again, I made a video explaining all of it. It's on YouTube. So I want you right now to go to the very end of the study guide, the last page in this unit and fill out that awesome chart that's right there. So take all the words in the word bank and plug them into the blanks to verify you understand the circular flow and understand how GDP is actually created. Stop this video and start it back up again. The one thing you gotta remember in the circular flow, households both demand and supply. They demand in the product market, but they supply in the resource market. And businesses supply and demand too. They supply in the product market, but they demand in the resource market. Which reminds me, keep in mind, your teacher might use the term factor market instead of resource market because factors of production, it's all the same stuff. On the top here, we're looking at the factors of production, land, labor, and capital. It's owned by the individuals and sold to the businesses. The businesses then take those resources and convert them into goods and services and sell them to the individuals, the households. Now, the video I put up on YouTube has households and businesses, and that's the private sector. When you add in the government, that's the public sector. Now on the chart, in the study guide, in the ultimate review packet, I also added the financial sector. But the key to this is to understand how it's related to GDP. Notice all the spending by households is just consumer spending, and all the spending by businesses, well that's investment. And of course, there's also government spending. Remember, that's three of the four components of GDP, C, I, and G. And again, in this chart, I actually don't have net exports, I didn't bring in other countries, but I could add that, I didn't because it just get complicated and ugly. But here in unit two, you need to understand an overview of how the economy works and the circular flow is gonna explain that for you. Don't freak out. Usually teachers and professors don't have you actually draw this thing out and make sure you can label all these. This is just gonna help you get an overview of how the economy works. Now I'm moving on to macroeconomics topic 2.2. In this case, we're still talking about GDP we're talking about its limitations. The first thing you have to remember is that GDP doesn't include all goods and services. There's several things that are not included. For example, intermediate goods. Goods that are used in the production of a final good don't count towards GDP. For example, the microchip inside your phone or your computer that you're watching this video on doesn't count separately in GDP. It's part of the finished product, so GDP counts that laptop or the phone, not all the components that went into the phone. And GDP doesn't include non-production transactions. So things like the stock market don't count towards GDP because nothing was produced produced and used goods don't count towards GDP for this year. If they're sold in a previous year, it counts in previous year's GDP, but not this year's if it's resold again. And of course, illegal or non-market transactions don't count in GDP because we don't know that they exist and they're being done on the table or illegally. So right now on the study guide, topic 2.2, fill out that section and answer those true false questions. Cause I think that's the best way to see if you understand the concepts and really get it is to give you some scenario to see if it counts or doesn't count towards GDP. Again, I made a video explaining all these concepts in detail if you still are really confused, go back and watch this video, then jump back into the summary video. So here in topic 2.3, we're talking about unemployment, and there's a lot of concepts you have to understand, like a lot of vocab. The labor force, labor force participation rate, unemployment rate, the different types of unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment. So it's kind of heavy on the vocab. And there's a little bit of calculations you have to do. Your teacher or professor might give you a scenario, say here's how many people are in society, here's how many people are in the labor force, here's how many people are unemployed, calculate the unemployment rate. And this is a skill you're gonna see a lot, so you have to feel comfortable with it. Understand the idea of how to calculate percent and how to calculate percent change. Calculating percent is easy, it's just the number you have divided by the total times 100, that pops out a number, and that's the percentage. And keep in mind, for most teachers, and definitely for the AP test, these are gonna be easy numbers. Easy to calculate, the answer is gonna be 10%, 20%, 5%, it's not gonna be like 17.28%. Though there are some professors that are crazy that do stuff like that, but really, you're not gonna see that. And for percent change, you just take the new number, subtract out the old number, 
divide that by the old number, and then multiply that times 100, and that gives you the percent change between those numbers. Remember that people are not unemployed unless they're actually looking for work. So if they stop looking for work, they actually leave the labor force and they're no longer part of labor force, no longer counted. And remember when you calculate the unemployment rate, you're not looking at the number of people in the total population, you're just looking at the number of people who are unemployed compared to the labor force. In other words, we don't count children or people who are too old to work or people that are not looking for a job. Only people looking and able to work they count as employed or unemployed, that's labor force. To verify you actually understand and can calculate all these things, do questions one through five on the study guide, that'll verify you're actually getting it. Now, in addition to these kind of numerical equation questions, you get a lot of questions about who's counted and not counted as unemployed by your teacher or professor. And there's two things you gotta watch out for. The first one is discouraged workers. These are people who have left the labor market, they've been unemployed for so long, they've been trying to find work, but they've given up. They're no longer counted as unemployed because they're no longer part of labor force. You'll see questions on that. You'll also see questions about part-time workers. Remember, if you're a part-time worker and you want more hours, that doesn't make you unemployed. You're still fully employed. So part-time workers, fully employed, they don't count as unemployed. Go ahead and answer questions six, seven, and eight in topic 2.3 on the study guide. That'll get it back in your brain and verify you understand that concept. Now let's move on to the other most important thing here in unemployment is the three types of unemployment, frictional, structural, cyclical. You're gonna to have to be able to define each one of these and give examples. In fact, a lot of teachers ask questions where they give you, you know, a scenario of different people and say, which one is frictionally unemployed? Or which one is structurally unemployed? You gotta know the difference. And you know this, frictional unemployment are people that are between jobs, so someone who just got out of college looking for their first job, they're frictionally unemployed. They have skills, people wanna hire them, they just haven't found a job yet. Structurally unemployed are people who do not have the right skills that people don't wanna hire because the structure of the labor market has changed. These are people People like VCR repairmen who don't have a job because people don't have VCRs and don't need that skill. So structural unemployment, that's gonna exist in the economy. And the last one is cyclical unemployment. That's the idea that there's a recession, the economy's doing poorly, people are buying less goods and services, and so workers are losing their jobs. Cyclical unemployment. An easy way to remember that is it's because the economy is sick, so it's cyclical unemployment. And that's important to remember because sometimes the economy is sick and doing horrible, or sometimes it's not and it's doing great. But either way, you're gonna have the first two types of unemployment. You're always gonna have frictional, people between jobs, and you'll always have structural. And this is a huge concept. When we're talking about unemployment and limiting unemployment, we're not trying to get it down to zero because two of them will always exist. So the whole idea of the natural rate of unemployment is the amount of unemployment that exists when we're at full employment, when there's no cyclical unemployment. Now what that actually number is depends on the country, but for the United States, basically it's between four to 6% unemployment. That's considered full employment. If we have like 8% unemployment, then definitely we have some cyclical unemployment and we have a recessionary gap or a recession. But in other countries, the natural rate of unemployment can be higher. You have more frictional and structural unemployment permanently in other countries that have higher unemployment benefits to their citizens. And basically people are between jobs longer because they can get some money from the government. But that's not the big takeaway. The big takeaway here is remember when we talk about full employment, we're not talking about 0% unemployment. You can't even get to that, it's not possible. We're talking about the amount of unemployment that exists at full employment when there's both frictional and structural employment and no cyclical. Right now, finish off topic 2.3 on the study guide in the Ultimate Review Packet to verify you understand these concepts. <laughs> okay, we're jumping into topic 2.4, price indices and inflation. Remember, overview, there's three things that every economy wants. Growth over time, which we measure with GDP, unemployment to reduce unemployment, which we look at the unemployment rate. And this last one, we wanna keep prices stable. And that's what we're talking about here with inflation. Now up to this point, this unit seemed very easy. It feels like a social science. It's kind of a lot of vocab concepts. Now you have to jump into more calculations. We talk about something called the consumer price index. The CPI is the most commonly used measurement of inflation. And basically they take a market basket of goods and services and track that over time to see if prices went up or down. And you might be thinking, well, prices go up for everything over time, but not always. Some products actually fall in price over time, but generally, yes, prices go up, that's called inflation. Now, sometimes prices fall, that's called deflation, and there's another thing called disinflation, when the inflation is going up higher, faster, 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 but eventually starts to level off, and it's going up at a slower rate, that's called disinflation. Anyways, back to CPI, it's one of those things you have to absolutely be able to calculate. It's the value of the market basket that you're given for some given year, divided by that same value of that same market basket in some given year, the base year, times 100, it pops at a number, that number is a CPI. The CPI for the base year is always 100, and any other given year has a different number, and that tells you how prices change relative 
to the base year. For a lot of students, doing those calculations and answering CPI questions is one of the hardest things in this unit. So right now, fill out the study guide for questions three, four, and five for topic 2.4. See if you actually can do those calculations. If you can't or you want more practice, check out the video inside the Ultimate Review Packet where I have you study and practice just CPI. The whole video covers just practicing that skill. And in addition to the CPI, there's also something called the GDP deflator, which instead of just looking at a market basket, it's looking at the value of everything Thing. So the equation here is the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP times 100 gives you the GDP deflator. Again, it's not the same as the CPI because it's looking at all goods and services in the economy, not just consumer goods, but the concept is very similar. We're looking at the value of the market basket, in this case everything, the nominal GDP divided by the value of that in a base year adjusted for inflation, the real GDP times 100. In a summary video like this, my goal is to get the concepts back in your brain, not to practice those individual skills over again. So right now, try questions eight through 12 on the study guide. If you can answer them, then you get it. If you can't answer them, go watch another video on YouTube to verify you understand that nominal and real GDP and calculating GDP deflator. Now there's one more thing I wanna cover in this topic. The CPI is not perfect, and your teacher might ask you questions about that, the problems of CPI. The first one is the substitution bias. When the price goes up for like chicken, the CPI says, oh look, price for chicken went up, but people might actually stop buying chicken and go buy something else instead like pork or beef or just not buy chicken, buy some other food. So products can be substituted away from even though the inflation rate says it's going up and the CPI says prices have gone up for some sort of good, people might actually be buying that good. And the other problem is new products. The CPI tracks a market basket over time, but when a new product that never existed before is added to that market basket, you really can't measure its price because it's not in previous baskets. And the last one is product quality. The CPI looks at inflation over time, but it doesn't analyze anything about the quality of those goods and services. For example, a computer from 30 years ago is way worse than the computer you have now. The prices maybe says it went up by 100% or 200%, but the quality like went up by a million percent. And I'm just throwing this in just in case your teacher asks you questions about this, but remember this topic is all about doing the calculations, understanding what CPI is, how to calculate it, what's the GDP deflator, and how to calculate it. If you're watching this video to self-study, don't think that my few minutes of just talking about what CPI was enough. You've got to sit down and you've got to practice it. All right, now we're moving on to topic 2.5. This is the cost of inflation. The big concept here you have to understand is who is helped and who is hurt by unanticipated inflation. What your teacher or professor is going to give you is a T-chart like this. The first thing you have to remember is the people who are hurt by inflation the most are lenders who lend at a fixed interest rate. So if I give you money at a 6% interest rate and inflation is 2%, then I expect a 4% return. But if inflation ends up being 10%, then I'm actually losing money on this deal. I'm actually getting paid back dollars that have less purchasing power than I expected. And people with fixed income, so they make $1,000 a month, when there's inflation, that's gonna erode their purchasing power, so they're hurt by inflation, and so are savers. And the other side, the people who were helped or benefited by unanticipated inflation are borrowers. When you take out a loan and there's more inflation than expected, then you're paying back dollars with lower purchasing power. So that actually helps you as a borrower. Another person that might benefit is a business where the price of the product increases faster than the price of the resource in the short run. Actually, now is a good time to talk about why you should be learning this stuff. Yes, I know you want to pass an AP test and do well on your final, but the real reason you want to understand inflation is someday you're going to have a job and you're going to have to negotiate your salary. And if there's a 2% increase in inflation, you got to go to your boss and say, listen, I need a 2% increase in my wage. That's the concept right here. Your nominal wage is your wage not adjusted for inflation. Your real wage is adjusted for inflation. So for example, if your boss says, hey, we're giving you a raise, a 3% raise this year, but inflation went up 5%, then you actually, your real wage fell 2%. If I lost you there, don't worry about it. Just understand the idea. Nominal is not adjusted for inflation. Real is adjusted for inflation. We'll come back to that later. And now is later. Topic 2.6, talk about nominal and real GDP. There's obviously a problem when you calculate the dollar value of all final goods and services produced in the country in a given year. What about the price of those goods and services? In other words, you know, Venezuela right now might have a huge GDP because the price of everything is astronomical. And economists don't like that, so they make an adjustment. They convert the nominal GDP to a real GDP, which you did earlier with the GDP deflator. So economists don't really analyze the nominal GDP of a country. They like to analyze the real GDP. Remember, the nominal GDP is measured in current dollars, 
real GDP is adjusted for inflation. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, what kind of question is my teacher or the final exam or the AP test gonna ask me? Let's actually do a practice question here. Remember that the GDP deflator, like the CPI, is an index number. It's not a percentage, but you can get the percentage if you understand what you're looking at. So what I want you to do is calculate the nominal GDP, write that down, stop the video, verify you got it, then start the video back up again. So if the real GDP adjusted for inflation is $200 billion, but the nominal GDP has to be higher than that, right? Because it says prices increased 20%. The GDP deflator says it's 120, 20% increase in prices since some base year. So the nominal GDP, the one that's not adjusted for inflation has to be $240 billion. Again, like I said with unemployment and other things in this class, usually your teacher or professor is not gonna give you super hard numbers. They're gonna be easy to calculate numbers that you can kind of do in your head. Again, if you're totally confused, go watch the practice video where I have you practice CPI and the GDP deflator. Okay, here we go. The last topic in this unit, 2.7, we're talking about business cycles and it has the key graph, which is right here. As you know, the economy goes up and down over time. There's four phases to the business cycle. There's a peak, there's a recession, also called a contraction. Then there's the trough and then there's the expansion or recovery and it keeps doing that over and over and over again. I made a video on YouTube where I talked about this in detail, but I want you to remember the key here is there's a difference between a recession and a recessionary gap. Okay, we're looking at the real GDP over time and this line here represents full employment. The idea that we have frictional and structural but no cyclical employment. This is when the economy is doing great, representing a trend line, full employment. That's called our potential GDP, but our actual GDP goes up and down over time. A recession is when the real GDP is actually falling, but down here, the GDP is actually going up but we're still in a bad situation because the actual GDP is below the potential GDP. In other words, we're not at full employment. This is called a recessionary gap or a negative output gap. And the opposite is up here. This is called a positive output gap. In this case, the economy is moving faster than full employment, which means frictional and structural employment are really low or like 2% unemployment and we're gonna get more inflation. Now, trust me, you're gonna see this concept again and again in the future, particularly in the next unit, we learn about something called aggregate demand and you draw all these concepts on a different graph. Okay, to help you learn this, I wanna put the business cycle next to the production possibilities curve that you learned back in unit one. Now, I didn't teach this to you before, but really the production possibilities curve has two separate lines here. This first one right here represents full employment. The idea we have frictional and structural unemployment, but no cyclical unemployment. So four to 6% unemployment, the economy is doing great. The outside line represents maximum capacity and 0% unemployment, which we said couldn't even be done in the first place. It's important when you see these graphs that you understand how they're related to each other. So a recession on the business cycle or a negative output gap is here. On the production possibilities curve, it's right here. We have high unemployment, the economy is doing terrible. Full employment looks like this on the business cycle with that point, and for production possibilities curve, it's on that line, the idea of full employment. But a positive output gap, when we have higher inflation, is right here on the business cycle and right here on the production possibilities curve. And right now it's time to fill out topic 2.7 in your study guide. Fill that sucker out, verify you understand the idea of the business cycle. I know I went quick in this summary video and I'm doing that on purpose because I'm trying to get the concepts back in your brain. Now, if you come across things you just do not understand, try some multiple choice practice questions that are in the ultimate review packet. Go ahead and try filling out one of the practice sheets or watch one of my other videos where you practice very specific skills. A complete list of all my videos organized by topic are in the ultimate review packet right now it's totally free, you can check it out. But overall, this is one of the easier units. I would give it a 2.5 out of five in terms of difficulty. We're gonna move into harder units though with units three and units four. There's gonna be more graphs and more calculations. Thanks for watching, until next time. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, please subscribe and like and leave a comment so I know what I can do to help you learn and love economics. Thanks for watching, until next time.